You are Locked On Packers, your daily Green Bay Packers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You are Locked On Packers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm Peter Bukowski, and I cover the Green Bay Packers for The Leap, a newsletter I would love for you to subscribe to. You can follow me on Twitter at Peter underscore Bukowski. Follow the podcast on Twitter at Locked On Packers. Like us on Facebook. Subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, on Spotify, on Google Podcasts, wherever you find podcasts. You will find Locked On Packers, the number one Packers podcast on the internet. And the show for fans who know what happened, they want to know why and how. Of course, you can subscribe to us on YouTube as well. And I want to thank everyone who makes Locked on Packers your first listen of the day. Every day, we are free and available on all platforms. Today's episode is brought to you by Rock Auto. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need. Visit rockauto.com and tell them Locked On sent you. Former Packers guard Mike Wall joins the show today for Expert Tuesday. He uh, was a part of a terrific first-person piece that we did for The Leap a few weeks back, talking about his career, his life, finding joy in the work that you do, especially as an offensive lineman, and ultimately what was a difficult decision for him to walk away and why perhaps it was less difficult than it might have otherwise been because of uh, where he was physically in his life uh he's going to come in and and join us to talk about the Packers Steelers week four game we are going to start the show today with uh some unfortunate news that we got from Matt LaFleur on Monday and and the news was not news necessarily okay so what we got was a non-update on the injury to Jair Alexander the reason there's news is not because of what Matt LaFleur said, but because of what he did not say. He refused to rule out the way that it was phrased him was, you know, will you rule out the worst case scenario? He was like, I'm sorry, I can't do that. Like we're still, we're still going through the, the situation here. We're still coming through the combing through the information. And what he later said was they are looking into second opinions, third opinions, whatever it is. So the team doctors have whatever information that they have, uh, x-rays, et cetera, and they are seeking out second opinions. Generally speaking, and I don't I, I, I don't like to speculate on injury, so I'm not going to speculate on what the injury is. It was reported as an AC joint sprain. That, that generally means separated shoulder uh, with, with ligament damage in there. And so, you, you know, you're, you're trying to figure out, okay, what is the severity? And what are the options? And when you go to specialists, when you seek second opinions, it it is generally speaking, okay? This is very important. Generally speaking, when you do that, it is not necessarily to diagnose the problem. In all likelihood, the Packers know what the injury is. It is to seek out best uh, options moving forward, whether that is kinds of rehab, uh, rehab versus surgery, types of surgery, types of treatment plans. Um, you know, uh, you know, sling. Can they? Can he play in a sleeve? Can he play in a harness? These are things that they're going to try and figure out. How much more damage could they do if he plays? What is the safe uh, window for surgery and then rehab? I mean, these are going to be the kinds of things you seek out second opinions for. Again, very important. I We do not know. We do not know. Matt LaFleur did not tell us what the injury is specifically. He said shoulder. That's all. We know what was reported, but we don't know the, the specifics or the severity. So there, the way that that my understanding of AC joint sprains, uh, and, and I've, I've talked to some people about it, is there's bad well, there's not so bad, there's bad, and there's really bad. So the there, there are options that you can rehab and they'll heal. And you know, it's we're talking about one to two, three weeks. That's on the low side. Then there's okay, this is a problem, and it's gonna take some time to heal. And okay, it's two to four weeks. 
in that range, five weeks, six weeks, maybe. Depends. It's this all depending on healing time. And then there's surgery. And then all bets are off because we just don't know uh, you know, how anybody's body reacts to surgery. Surgery is just one of those things where, where there could be a million ways your body reacts to it. And that would be a longer term thing. Now, now, generally speaking, you're not talking about season ending, especially not in week four, unless there's some part of this injury that we don't know about. And even then that would seem pretty unlikely. Um, you know, even a, even a broken collarbone would be eight to 10 at, at the top end, generally speaking, you miss half a season, not a whole season in, in a 17 week season now, or a 17 game season, an 18 week season, having 14 plus weeks, it's pretty good. Plus short term IR, there are, there are options here for Jair and, and this is not the meat of your schedule yet. So if you're going to sustain another injury, ugh, another injury to one of your best players, I mean, we're talking about of the five or six best players on this roster right now, four of them are hurt. I mean, David Bakhtiari, Elton Jenkins, Zedaria Smith, Aaron Rodgers, Devontae Adams, Jair Alexander, like those are probably your six best players. Did I repeat anybody? Uh, and that's that's not ideal. Now, Elton Jenkins is week to week. He could be back soon. David Bakhtiari, uh, he's got to be out at least two more weeks, but he could be back by Washington. He could be back on that short week against uh, uh, the Cardinals. Aaron Rodgers, luckily, healthy. But if you're going to lose Jair Alexander now for four to six weeks, six to eight weeks, that puts a lot of strain on your team. Now, as I said, you've got Cincy this week, Chicago next week, Washington the following weeks. Those are games that, you know, even 85% healthy, you feel like ought to be wins. I mean, the Packers are three and a half point favorites in Cincinnati, which means the odds makers, the people at bet online, they think the Packers are probably close to a touchdown better than a team like the Bengals. My guess is they will be at least a field goal favorite in Chicago, if not more, unless Justin Fields just looks otherworldly this week. And they're going to be favorites at home for Washington. Now, after that, the, the schedule, I mean, the schedule is brutal there. You've got at Arizona, at Kansas City, home for Seattle, at Minnesota, home for the Rams, Thanksgiving weekend, home for the Bears, at Baltimore, home for Cleveland, home for, for the Vikings before you finish the season in Detroit. That's like half the season, and it's brutal. It's brutal, and you're probably not going to have Zedaria Smith for most of it. You're going to get David Bakhtiari back here relatively quickly. You're going to get Elton Jenkins back as soon as this week. You hope, you th you'd think latest next week. But but ankles are notoriously tricky. It's it's tough for a team that is, you know, fancies itself a Super Bowl contender and is a Super Bowl contender to be dealing with these kinds of issues is is I mean, it's a bummer, obviously. Uh, and they don't have a lot of options at some of these spots. And that that even is before what's going on at outside linebacker where Preston Smith gets banged up in this game. He comes back, is clearly not a hundred percent. They probably can't survive with with Jonathan Garvin and Chauncey Rivers out there playing more snaps than they're already playing. They need someone like Zadarius Smith back in a big way. Or they need to make a move. They need to sign someone. There's not a lot of guys just out there on the street. And it's too early in the season for a lot of these teams to just suddenly be jettisoning assets, guys that could actually help the Packers. That probably is going to happen you know, late October. So they're just going to have to weather the storm right now. They're just going to, and, and, you know, offensively, they found some ways to mitigate the issues with the offensive line. That's great. They're going to get those guys back. There's going to be a stretch here where they might be without Ja. They might be without Z. And this defense is going to be starting guys like Eric Stokes and Kevin King on the outside. That might happen as soon as this week. And that is really going to test your, your defense. And it's really going to test your offense. It's when you need, Aaron Jones and Devontae Adams and, and Randall Cobb, who steps up in this game, and Aaron Rodgers to be playing his best for the offensive line to be coalescing the way that they are. You need all of that stuff if you're going to be having all of your guys ready to hit the ground running at the end of the year. So there's there's some real adversity here that they're going to have to deal with. So they have some options in the cornerback room, right? 
Kevin King is coming back as soon as this week. Shamar John Charles played at the end of the game on Sunday. Was that because they felt like he was a better choice than Isaac Yadam? Or was it just, hey, let's give this guy some, some run because it looks like Jaw's going to be hurt a couple weeks. And if we need him, we need him. I don't know, you know what that looks like. They do have some options. They could put Shannon Sullivan outside. I don't know if that's a great option. They could play. I mean, they already play a bunch of two high safety looks. So that helps from the standpoint of protecting your corners a little bit. But to not have that guy now that you feel like can just lock down his side and who defenses don't want to throw. I mean, Eric Stokes saw 15 targets in this game. 15 targets. Because Jair Alexander is on the other side. I mean, that's the only reason. You wouldn't throw it at any cornerback 15. Teams didn't throw at Kevin King 15 times. But when you have Jair on the other side, it's going to happen. No, I thought Eric Stokes played played pretty well overall. I mean, gave up 82 yards on 15 targets. Um, 10 of 15 for 82. You, you live with that all day. Um, so I'm not worried about it. But now if your pass rush is banged up, man, it's starting, it's starting to get tough to put together a path defensively to, to be any good. Luckily, offensively, this team is, is really hitting its stride. All right, we're going to get to Mike Wall in just a second. Before we do, let's talk about our friends at Bet Online. We're back and better than ever. All eyes on the gridiron as teams fight for their football lives. As always, Bet Online is your number one spot for all your pro and college football action this season with the new updated site and interface. Even more odds, props, and contests. Bet Online continues to be your number one source for everything football. Head to the website or use your mobile device and sign up today to get a 50% welcome bonus on that first deposit when you use the promo code Locked On. From football, basketball, boxing, Vegas casino games, don't wait to take advantage of all of the offers in the 2021 season. Bet online is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your favorite sports action. Use that promo code Locked On to get that 50% welcome bonus. And I want to thank everyone again who makes Locked on Packers your first listen of the day. We are free and available on all platforms. All right, joining us now for Expert Tuesday. You read his story in The Leap. He is former Packers guard Mike Wall. And Mike, I'm, I'm really happy to have you here. Uh, and I, I think this is a great opportunity for, for our listeners and for Packer fans to get to know you a little bit better. You and I have had the chance to, to chat a little bit uh, offline and, and I have, I have loved those chats. So I, I, I really thank you for being here. Oh, thanks for having me, Peter. No, absolutely. A pleasure. Pleasure. Uh, always an opportunity to talk about Packers football and, and try to reach out to some of the fans and just let them know different perspectives. I love the opportunity. So thank you for it. We were talking before we came on, uh, that, that you had, had just got done watching some of the, uh, the, the coaches tape from this game. I just finished my rewatch of this game as well. Just high level. What stood out to you from this game for Green Bay? Well, I think defensively, what was interesting to me is I, I came in thinking that the Steelers offensive line looked like a high school offensive line, like with the games <laughs> I've watched before. And honestly, they just looked like they didn't belong. And you think about it always because I'm an offensive lineman, I think about when they lost Mike Munchak as their coach two years ago, everything just went downhill, right? And then yeah. they lost Ramon Foster that year. They lost Mike Pound, or Marquise the next year with um, DeCastro. And so now this is a completely different line. Villanueva is gone. And they they don't look very good to me, coupled with the fact that Ben Roethlisberger can't move as well. Right. And it, there's just something that, that's missing, right, and that kind of connection that he has with his receivers. So I actually watched the game, and I'm thinking it was a great win, but we should have dominated more uh, on the defensive line. Like this is one of those games where we should have gotten home more. Right. Right. And we could have gotten home more and there just could have been a little bit more disruption. And you see a lot of the things that happen on defense. Um, they did a lot of good. And I think I think Gary is finally figuring out kind of how to pass, how to rush a passer, using a little more speed to power, like using power is the first move to get the guy really uncomfortable and then he can start right. working off it. So you love that. You love the way obviously 97 is playing at a very, very high level. Um, but you see a lot of plays in the game where like Roethlisberger for the first time in his life, is not seeing some of the coverages like he should. Right. He's not putting the ball in the places that he should. Like the one that he had behind um, the 22 in the right, right in front of the right in front of uh, right in front of the center. He was misreading. They ran like four tan, so they cut the backside. The third receiver on the backside. He he was surprised, and he he actually he threw it to 22. Like 
Like, oh, I'm going to throw it over there. And, you know, it was just one of those things. He just looks so out of, <laughs> out of character because he's been so good for so long, right? Right. And then on the on the other side, the Packers have what I would call first world problems right now because <laughs> they're going to get two really good offensive linemen back, like all pro caliber offensive linemen. And they have a left guard right now that can play. Yeah. And he can flat out play. And and my, like my game ball actually goes to Billy Turner the way the Billy Turner has been playing, but the way he played and, and wow. you, I mean, you don't hear TJ Watts name except for when he trips a guy, right? Like he didn't really, he wasn't involved in the game. And that's, that's a testament to obviously the way they scheme and everything, but between that and the way that if you look at the green Bay Packers, the way they're exploiting a team like the, like the Steelers with a three down line look is you have to win on the backside block. That's really the only single block you have. And he did a, he did a masterful job for most of the game. So I'm really excited to see what happens in like six weeks from now. Like, I don't know who they're going to take out to put those other two guys in, you know, like I said, but it's first world problems, man. It's, it's fun to watch. Have you, so Rashawn Gary gets a sack through the tackle and Kingsley Kiki deposits the guard in Ben Roethlisberger's lap on that sack fumble. Can you remember a guy who just dump trucked you like that? Did, did that ever happen to you? Oh yeah. So many times. <laughs> Thanks for bringing it up. Yeah. It happens all the time. <laughs> Um, gosh, so I, you know, there's, there's a, there's a moment. So if you play offensive line, so I played it like 295 and, and you get stronger and you get better and you get better technique. But for a lot of time I was just struggling. And right. so I remember when I moved into guard, we were playing Fred Robbins in, I think he was in Minnesota at the time. And it was one of those games where it's up in Minnesota. Like we, you know, we're hiking the ball with Brett's head. <laughs> Things are going bad. So it's like, it feels like it's third and 18 a lot, you know? And he just decides to bull rush me. And you get these moments where you're like, you just get to this point of no return where your feet are kind of, your toes are out, your hips are engaged, you're trying to lock out and there's there's nowhere for you to go. If he keeps rushing, you're gonna go down. And that happened like three times in a row in that game where he's just like, dump, dump. Luckily Brett got rid of the ball, but that's what happens with offensive linemen more than, you'd like, than we'd like to admit is a lot of really bad things happen on like quick passes. Like you'll get dumped or you'll whiff or something. Like you just, it just doesn't happen to show on camera because they're not going to repeat it. Nobody's got a camera on like the defensive tackle, but it happens more than you'd like to admit. So you mentioned the defensive side of this um, and Eric Stokes, I was just looking at some of the numbers. He got targeted 15 times yeah. by pro football focuses charting. Yeah. That is a remarkable number. Now he only gave up 82 yards, 10 catches did have the pick. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing that has stood out to me over the last three weeks, Mike, is we have not seen guys just running wide ass open through this secondary. And that had been a problem over the last few years, coverage busts, guys running open, this idea of playing soft. And a lot of it, you know, I hate to lay it all at the feet of one guy because it's not, but a lot of it had to do with who the other corner was opposite Jair Alexander. And I don't think it's right. a coincidence that over the last three weeks, right. they played some stickier coverage. This is as disciplined a back end for the Packers over the last three weeks as I've seen them play in a long time, I think. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And the thing that stands out is everybody in the league right now, defensively, unless you're just, you know, top three defense, everybody in the league is basically saying the same thing. If you have a decent quarterback, they're saying, I, I bet you can't make five yard throws and I bet you can't run the ball all the way down the field. I think you're right. going to, I think you're going to get greedy. I think your coordinator is going to get greedy. I think your lineman is going to get a hold. I think something bad's going to happen. It's going to stop the drive. And so when you watch these guys play, so they're playing like a two shell, just like a cover two look. And, and Stokes is playing extremely soft on 18, like to the point where you're like, well, wait a second, you got to press him a little bit. Like you don't just, you don't give, you know, make him release outside. You kind of do the cover two stuff, but he's playing eight yards off. And he's letting him get the little hitch pass to the five yard out. And it's frustrating because you think you know what he should be doing. But the truth is they're playing extremely, like you said, they're keeping him in front of them. They keep playing extremely disciplined. And they know that eventually someone's going to get home on the rush. Right. But they're just making sure that nobody's getting behind him. I mean, really, we've watched the game. The only time that somebody was absolutely wide ass open was the one that Ben should have put some air underneath to yep. Juju. Yeah, that the was double the only move play in the slot. There was just, I mean, really, really, nobody's it, nobody's back there if he makes that catch. But everything else, man, they got they got people to make plays. And really, all you got to do is come up and make tackles in a game like that, where you know the Packers are going to drop thirty at least on that team. You know, you, you like like you said before before we got on the air. It's not about the offense. It's not about the defense. It's about how the entire team's game plan comes together yep. 
to work with one another, right? You can't have one with the uh, without the other if you're playing against a quality opponent. One thing that that stands out to me too from this game, and and really over the last couple of weeks, because they've had to do it with you know bailing wire and sheet metal on the offensive line with these rookies and and backups and and Yash Nijman's out there and and they're getting chips with Mercedes Lewis and Alan Lazard is making blocks. I mean, he sealed yeah. TJ Watt on a third and one run. And it's just yep. like receivers are not supposed to do this uh, for this team. But w- when you look at that group, this Packers team played with incredible balance. And a lot of that is this RPO look where Rodgers gets to make the decision. Hey, we like this front. And so we're going to we're going to run the ball here. 36 pass attempts, 33 rush attempts in this game. And this is something that you and I have talked about in the past. Getting those offensive linemen a chance to come downhill can breed a little bit of confidence for when they do have to see TJ Watt and Alex Highsmith and Cam Hayward running at them. If you're getting after them in the run game, I assume you feel better about them now coming at you a little bit. Yeah, so much more. And when you look at the 36 and the 33, a lot of the plays that are, end up being passes are are designed those RPOs like you're talking about. So a lot of the time they're just coming off the ball anyways. Right. And if you look at it, you just kind of break it down. Who's got these really difficult jobs and how often do they have to d- deal with them? You look at like last yesterday, Billy Turner on paper is playing against the the defensive player of the year. So he's got a really difficult job, but he doesn't have to drop back 37 times, right? He's only dropping back 15 and he's getting a chip on five of them. So he's got probably got 10, 10 times during the game where he's got to block that guy one V one. Now that's hard, but that's a lot easier than, you know, you remember like last year with the Houston Texans, you know, D four is dropping back 71 times a game or something like that. Something ridiculous. And you can imagine how difficult that is. And kind of like we talked about before the joy that leaves your heart when you realize, right. gosh, I got to block TJ Watt one-on-ones, you know, 50 times a game. That's a right. really, really hard ask. So yeah, you, you, you couldn't be more right on that. And I just love the way, again, there's a sequence in that game that just kind of describes what the Packers look like when they're in rhythm. And sometimes we see them and you're just like, man, this is a, the way they're calling play, everything looks so easy. You forget that all their players are really, really good. And that's why they look easy. <laughs> right. But they ran a they ran a motion sweep to the right. Then they ran a motion toss sweep to the left. Then they ran a motion downhill. Then they took a shot. Then they did a three step drop out of empty. Right. And then they ran a quick screen. And it was and the quick screen was off an RPO. And you're just like, okay, realistically, they had the linemen had one play where they're not going, oh, this is awesome. There was one play in there and yeah. it's empty. So they, so then they know the Steelers are really, they have three real linemen in the game. They might bring it. They might bring a linebacker. It's just a great, it's such a good scheme for what, what you know, the personnel they have and obviously what they're trying to get accomplished. Yeah. The, the, the scheme, I think too, you know, the, Aaron Rodgers talked in the preseason about trying to evolve and push this offense forward. I, I do wonder, you mentioned the first world problems when, when these guys come back, how this offense is going to change. I actually, I, I went to pro football focus and I said, Hey, it looks like they're playing in the gun more this year than last year. It just felt like that to me. And the numbers are almost identical and they're almost identical on third down too. And so they're just, what they're doing, just the diversity with which this offense can play really is remarkable. And it's a credit both, I think to, to Matt LaFleur and the offense that they put together, but also to Brian Gutekinds, the different kinds of players and let's not let's not forget GM Aaron Rodgers bringing in Randall Cobb. What, sure. what did you what did you see from from Randall? Why I wrote about this a little bit for the leap uh, uh, yesterday. Why do you think this was the week that Cobb was able to get off? Well, for one, if we're going to start really really high level, the reason that anybody in this in this uh, on this team is going to get off aside from Devontae Adams is because the Pittsburgh Steelers everything is designed so Devontae Adams doesn't beat them. Yeah. The whole the whole secondary coverage is every single play. It's amazing to watch, actually, because they're very, very happy to play soft on everybody else. They'll play one over the top with three on two. They don't – as long as Devontae Adams has bracket coverage, they're like <laughs> – And mean, they had so him in you, brackets all day. Yeah, so now you can – now you have five or six guys in the box. You can run it whenever you want, right? And you have Aaron – it's like you have Aaron Jones. Like he's, a, he's an – you have amazing running backs. And you have this offensive line that loves coming off the ball. They're all big. And so when you watch, like, when he watches uh, Cobb's touchdown on the, on the dig route, when he, cro- when he crosses the safety's face, it's like, 
it's a great play, and the safety's not allowed to let him cross. It's like that cardinal sin, number one, when you're funneling there, you can't let him cross your face. Number one, you right. just can't do it, right? You should be able to drive on that. The safety turn, it's, you know, it's all technique. He turned his hips too early, and so it was super easy to cross his face. He's going to get outrun because now he's got to t- change directions and all that. But, you know, Randall Cobb's one of those guys where they have this rapport. He knows when Aaron's going to throw the ball. Um, you know, I think they had a, one of the really good plays they had was at the end of the game. They did a quick play action pass. It was literally like dive, fake dive, turn, and pop it to him. And he's just always like he, he knows exactly when to turn his head. I mean, it, it's it's just experience. And that's why, you know, Aaron wanted to bring him back. But, you know, just the highest level, when a team is so focused on stopping one guy and you actually have like six really good players, it, it, seem, it almost seems asinine to me. Like just play <laughs> – I, I, you think it's like just play defense. You, you can't, I know you have to take something away, like the old Bill, you know, Belichick, like I gotta take something away, but like Belichick takes something away is like, I'm going to take away passing or I'm going right. to take away running. I'm not going to take away one guy. It's like, it doesn't make any sense to me, but I don't know. Their ability to, to, to find ways. I mean, there was a throw that, that he made. I posted it on Twitter where the safety, the safety is shaded to his side and they just make that unbelievable throw to the sideline where it's like, it's only where Devontae Adams can get it. To your point, he knows just when to turn to find the ball and he makes that play on the sidelines. The fact that they're still able to hit those, it has to just be so demoralizing for a defense knowing that like, hey, yeah, when whenever we want, I mean, they hit the comeback at the end of the game that looked like it was going to seal it on third and eight. Just like whenever they want, it seems like they can get to that stuff. And I just, as a defense, it just has to be backbreaking. And you think about who they have on D. I mean, even the secondary, Joe Hayden. I, last time I checked, Joe Hayden was really – Minka Fitzpatrick. Like, Minka's amazing. unbelievable. I, had, I was with him in Miami for a year. He's um, one of the most athletic dudes I've ever seen in my life, right? I mean, he's making plays all over the all over the yard for these guys. Cam Hayward up – last year, Cam Hayward was un- completely unblockable. Couldn't right? block him. Completely unblockable. TJ you – know, I mean, we know they have guys, and, so, and they have a lot of pride there. They have a history of being a really, really good team. But the truth is – you can only literally put one person in front of him at a time. And Aaron's, you know, as I think they said it last night on the, or yesterday on the, on the, on the, on the television, if he has an idea what you're running beforehand, you really don't have a chance because he's just that smart. And guys always talk about arm strength and escapability. When we talk about quarterbacks, we talk about these new running, you know, you know RPO quarterbacks, but the guys who sustainably win all the time, are the guys that are the smartest people in the room. And they don't, I'm not talking about like IQ smart. They've made themselves the smartest people in the room because they understand football better than everybody else on the field. And Aaron Rodgers is just one of those guys. And, and fortunately he plays for the Packers. I was struck rewatching the game. Cause it's, it's not always, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not necessarily watching for it as much during the game, but the amount of post snap disguise that the Steelers threw at the Packers and and their ability to say, okay, we're going to show you single high, we're going to rotate. This is stuff we thought Joe Barry would would be doing, but the the intricacy of that defense is really remarkable. From you know, it wasn't that long ago that you were playing, but mm-hmm. we're, what have you seen from these defenses trying to adjust to these quote unquote modern offenses with some of this pre and post snap disguise because it's got to just be so hard to play defense now with what the offenses can do. How do you, how, how have you seen that change? Well, I think we talk about it a lot more. I, you know, I think it's probably the biggest thing. I mean, everybody, you and I are the media, everyone's kind of identified that as a deal. And really the guy that made it popular to be honest is, is probably Peyton Manning because Peyton Manning had his own staff of people understanding exactly, you know, which way was the safety's foot going to be in this coverage, right? The same thing that we did with offense or defensive linemen, understanding like that individual, you start picking out individuals and and then you start building a book off them and they were going to kind of tell you the story. But from a defensive perspective, when you, when you look at it, how the games evolved because of, because of it's now the passing league and it's now fantasy football and they've had to make all these adjustments. And the pre-snap read, and we talked about they, they talked about this at length, I think, with the Bucks game last night with the Patriots, trying to show something and, and play into something else. And I think right now, just because of the athleticism at every position in the secondary, it allows yeah. them to disguise coverages a little bit more than they than they used to. Guys aren't as obvious. In other words, I can sit at 15 yards with, with flat feet, and at the snap, I can make something happen. Where before, I'd probably have to cheat it earlier. I'd probably have to drop down earlier. And the other thing too, Peter, we just talked about it honestly. 
with a lot of this stuff, they're okay now. Defenses are all right giving up short plays. They're, the whole thing now is it's a war of attrition. I don't think you can go the, the yard on me. You know, I mean, like last yesterday, it's crazy. You remember back in the day when an offense crossed the 40 yard line, they got in the field goal range. Your, your first line was coming back in. Not anymore. They didn't even think about it. You know, I mean, it's, they just they keep the second guys in there and let our, let our offensive line pound on them for a while. You know, it's more about I want to keep them out of the end zone. Like the, the mindset has changed. So I think that, that might be the biggest the change that I see. Mike, this was awesome. We could talk all day. We could do an hour. Uh, unfortunately, we do not have an hour. So we'll have to have you back and, and do this again. Let my listeners know because uh, you you are you are doing some other fun stuff. Let them know uh, what you're up to. Yeah, check me out. We I do a player development podcast called Process to Perform. I work with a lot of uh, ath- professional athletes, college, high school, all the way down to 12, 13 years old, um, really helping them become kind of elite level competitors, best you know, become the best versions of themselves. So if you're interested in anything like that, check me out on Process to Perform. I do that player development podcast, Process to Perform. You can find anywhere, Apple, iTunes, Spotify, et cetera. And then Amon Green and I also do a Packers podcast on the Believe Network. It's called On My Block. We'll be hitting, actually, we're going to record that here pretty soon too, Peter. So uh, talking about a lot of the same thing. We get a little bit off topic. Probably you do a much better job staying on topic than we do. <laughs> we, we start kind of going back into, hey, you remember, we, a lot of get off my lawn stories on On, on My Block. But uh, I love it. if you're a Packers fan, you'll enjoy it. I love it. Stay stay on their block, but stay off their lawn. Uh, Mike, I appreciate it, man. This is great. All right, thank you, Peter. All right, I want to thank Mike Wall for joining the show. Great to talk to him. I, I've had a couple long conversations with him uh, offline, and he is just man. He's fun to talk to. He he will just he will just talk and talk. He loves to talk ball, and and I love that about him. Um, follow him on Twitter. It's it's unrivaled ess. We we probably need to talk to him about getting a little bit better branding with that. But on Twitter at rivaled ESS uh, and, and check out his, his show with Amon Green. There's there's plenty of of stay off my lawn stuff that that I love when, when, when players get together and talk. So I would check that out. Today's episode is brought to you by our good friends at Rock Auto. With the ever increasing number of makes and models, it's now impossible for your local auto parts store to stock all the parts that you need. So why endure often pointless or seemingly intimidating questions and wait while the person behind the counter orders the parts on their computer, choosing the only brand their warehouse happens to carry? You have computers with access to rockauto.com at home and in your pocket. Save time and money when using Rock Auto. Why spend 30%, 50%, even 100% more for the same parts from a chain store or car dealership when you could go to rockauto.com, a family business serving do-it-yourselfers for over 20 years. Go to rockauto.com right now and see all the parts available for your car or truck and write locked on in there. How did you hear about us box? Say so you no, know we sent you. If you're like me, just about every day, you stare into your cabinet going, why don't I have anything good in the house? If you're a cheese head, you probably love cheese as much as you love the green and gold. You know how the best part of a grilled cheese sandwich is the cheese that melts off in the pan and gets crunchy? Well, Just the Cheese made a bar out of just that. That's why I started snacking on Just the Cheese. Just the Cheese brings you cheese, 100% cheese, no fluff, no filler, like you've never had it before as a salty baked snack. It's cheese and crackers, but without the crackers, which means without the unnecessary carbs. My cabinet is full of them. My favorite is the jalapeno. It's cheesy, spicy. It's a it's a great combination. And there's no complicated recipes or almond flour that makes you feel like you're eating health food. Just natural cheese. Baked until it's crunchy to give you that great taste of Wisconsin cheese with the crackle of a cracker. Check them out at Quick Trip and support two Wisconsin businesses at once. That's right. Just the cheese. 100% cheese with the crackle of a cracker. And... Even though you made Lockdown Packers your first listen, make your second listen the Peacock and Williamson show. Brian Peacock and former NFL scout Matt Williamson give you the expert NFL analysis in less than 30 minutes. It too is free and available on all platforms. All right, we are going to be back tomorrow. How you doing? Crossover Thursday, live stream on Friday. We were, we're not going to go live after the Bengals game, um, but we will have a show on Monday. So a lot, you know, always, always how we do it. The schedule is the schedule. We will have plenty of opportunities. There's a lot of big games coming up, plenty of opportunities to go live after these games. Thanks to everyone who comes and hangs out with us. We have a blast doing them. Follow me on Twitter at Peter underscore Bukowski. Follow the podcast on Twitter at locked on Packers. Like us on Facebook, 
Subscribe to the podcast, iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, wherever you find podcasts, you will find Locked on Packers. Subscribe on YouTube, where you could be watching this right now. Check us out on iTunes, Spotify, wherever you find podcasts, you will find Locked on Packers. Subscribe to The Leap. And anytime you want to hit us up on the Locked on Packers fan hotline, you can do that, 920-341-3775 to stay Locked on Packers.